Welcome to Comics Bazaar, the channel of comics commentary and arcana. This video features the Uncanny X-Men number 340, cover dated January 1997. The cover is by Joe Madureira, inked by Tim Townsend and coloured by Steve Bucciolato. The cover caption is Son's Pain, refers to Iceman with his father there. We've got a classic Pieta style pose. Every comics artist, every superhero comics artist has to do a Pieta cover at least once in their career. So this is Joe Madureira's version. It's pretty decent. And what's going on here is that Iceman and his father, who haven't really gotten along very much in the course of their history together, and especially during Scott Lobdell's run, have, um, well, what's happened um, previously is that the father has defended mutants at a TV interview for Great and Creed. He was in the audience and did that. And so very obviously there's been some kind of um, payback for speaking up for mutants that's occurred here. And that's revealed on the cover. So let's open this one up to the uh, splash page. And it is set in a hospital. And very clearly there we have um, Iceman and he's at his father's bedside who is in intensive care. The title of the story is Relativity and the creative team down here, Scott Lobdell, writer, Joe Madureira, penciler, Tim Townsend, inker, Richard Starkings and Comicraft lettering, Steve Bucciolato and Team Booch on the digital colours. So Iceman there in his first person narration is detailing who he is and um, that he's an X-Man. He asks himself, why do I do it? To be honest, right here, right now, I have absolutely no idea. So he really does look distraught and in sorrow at his father's bedside. And as I said, these two haven't normally gotten along. So a nice, interesting angle there. Some good work put into establishing this intensive care um, uh, room by Madureira. Turn the page, an Iceman. Um, one of his teammates come to him, comes to him and it is Storm. So uh, we get to see Joe Madureira's version of Storm again. He does a very uh, particular version of her with that very kind of manga-esque um, haircut that he's given her. And we have Gambit there in the background as well. And it's unusual to see Iceman and Storm interacting and we're going to get that in this particular issue. But a nice couple of pages there, obviously having spent time on the detail of the hospital room on the splash page, he gets to um, have an easier uh, job with the backgrounds by filling them in mostly in black here on this particular page. And then again, a bit of detail here with another, another angle on the bed that his father is in. So Storm asks Iceman who, who did this to him and... Um, Iceman replies, very good expression there, and cl uh, tight close-up on his eyes, Creed. So that's great in Creed. The human son of Mystique and Sabretooth, who is running for president, and um, who is running on an anti-mutant platform. So then the scene switches to Graydon Creed's um, campaign headquarters, perhaps even his um, domain, his mansion. And we get first person narration here for Sam Guthrie for Cannonball. Um, and he is talking about, you know, what he usually does, mixing it up with one costume, bad guy or another, apocalypse, sinister, once upon a time, Magneto. But right here and now, things are different. We're up against something a lot less obvious, but maybe a lot more dangerous. We're confronted by something we just can't hit. In a lot of ways, by squaring off against presidential candidate Graydon Creed and his anti-mutant platform of hate, we're fighting an idea. So there in the background, there is a Creed for President banner going to be strung up. And uh, yeah, some good detail here, nice top-down angle on this particular location. Good work here. You get to see Madureira's um, very cartoony design for Sam, huge broad shoulders, very narrow waist and a big baggy 90s jacket on him there. Let's turn the page, and he walks up to Graydon Creed's private office, and that office is being guarded by these two hulking security figures. They really do have the proportions of the Hulk, most particularly the Grey Hulk, which makes me um, kind of wonder what would it have been like 
for Madureira to do a nice run on um, the Grey Hulk. That would have been intriguing. So Cannonball is there. He is a covert agent of Cyclopses in the Graydon Creed um, campaign for president. Iceman was too. And um, he's grabbed there by the security goon who says, Mr. Creed doesn't wish to be disturbed just now. And then this is kind of this is kind of interesting because I've been complaining about the characterization of Cannonball by Lobdell in particular, since he's the newest member of the X-Men. He was kind of acting as a very neophyte um, in his characterization. And that really doesn't square with um, Cannonball, who was leader of X-Force, while Cable was presumed dead after um, Executioner's Song. But here he thinks, and this is more in keeping with that Fabian Nicieza written earlier version of Cannonball, I can think of 12 different ways to remove his hand, half of which would allow him to keep it attached to his arm. But this is me being subtle. So that's good. That's spot on. That's more aligned with that earlier version of Cannonball from X-Force. But Creed comes out of his office and he tells the goons, give Sam and me a few minutes together. So now we get in Sam's first person narration, a whole spiel about Grade and Creed, his parentage, and Sam says here, and it, I guess it's something that readers might be thinking, could we out him? Sure, but it don't seem like much of a solution, fighting fear and loathing with more of the same, or as my dad used to say, you can't put out a fire with gasoline. So in goes Sam into Graydon Creed's private office, nice top-down angle there, and um, Creed uh, says to Sam, I have something of a problem, I'm hoping you could help me solve it. And Sam in his first person narration says, why don't I like the sound of that? But he says to Creed, I'll try, sir. So of course we're wondering from what from the opening with um, uh, Iceman's father beaten, beaten up, what is going on with Graydon Creed? Has he learned somehow that um, both Iceman and Cannonball are plants in his campaign? And at that moment, we have a heart-to-heart -heart between Robert Drake and Aurora Munro, Iceman and Storm, on the roof of the hospital. So we, as I said earlier, we don't usually see these two characters interacting, so it's intriguing to see just exactly that here. You know, Iceman very much a jokester type character, but obviously he's, um, you know, um, sorrowing now in terms of what's happened to his father, and he's confused as well because he hasn't really had a good relationship with his father. But he says here to Storm, my father was hurt for one reason, because he was helping me. If I spend the night sobbing and tearing at my clothes, then I've let him down again. It started this morning, about 3 a.m. Kennedy Airport. So now we get the backstory. And we get that classic device of the curved edges of panel borders when we're having a flashback. And in his first person narration, he explains how he was talking strategy with Grade and Creed's aide, Carly Alvarez. When Creed looked at me and asked, do you believe the sins of one generation are passed to the next? How do you mean? Asked Iceman. Let's say if a father behaves a certain way, do you believe the son will as well? No, why do you? Good, Robert, then I'd like you to help me solve a little problem, says Creed. Let's turn the page. Out there in the clearing, that's where my problem is. So, um, Iceman says, I took the first step slowly. That's really well done. Um, that particular drawing of one foot in front of the other coming behind. That's nicely done. You know, you think about it, how would you draw that? Well, it's very well done with the shoe and the pressure of the uh, foot on the shoe leather there. Um, the laces, the drapery of the trouser leg, that's really good stuff from Madureira. Um, obviously, you know, doing some life drawing that allows him to abstract that for his cartoonish comic style works really well. So then Iceman gets a bad feeling, starts running. The jet flies over his head there, that's nicely done as well. And he finds his father beaten in the clearing. I understood what Creed was asking. He wasn't talking about him and his father Sabretooth. He was talking about me and dad after he stood up for mutants during Trish's newscast. So that was in X-Men, Adjectiveless X-Men number 58. Creed's people must have found out who he was. He must have figured, like father, like son. I didn't tell him anything, Bobby says his father to him. Um, and so there we go, and Creed is flying off in his jet. So Creed hasn't, it seems, twigged, seems he hasn't twigged, 
that um, Iceman was a mutant, but he booted him from his campaign because his father was sympathetic and expressed public sympathy uh, to mutants at that um, TV interview. So now we're back in the present on the roof and Storm is asking um, our saint to Iceman, your father's a brave man. And he's still baffled he's there who knew i mean his whole life he carries on like i don't know like he hates me but then let me get this nice silent panel here this is very good emotion on his face this is really well done in terms of you can see like he's uh, holding back the tears there we've got those little um that quivering there on his chin and also the eyes about to well up that's really really well done really good expression on that face they tried to beat him into turning me in, into giving them something on me, but he didn't. Why would he do that, Storm? And Storm's response is, I can think of only one reason, Robert. So the one reason is that he loves his son, of course, but we won't hear that until the very end of the issue. But that's a nice page there. But again, you can see when you think about it, there's no backgrounds. So Madureira just concentrating on um, the figure drawing there, doing a great job of it. So another one of these top-down angles where uh, Graydon Creed is out on um, this particular balcony with uh, Cannonball and we're wondering, does he know that Cannonball is a mutant? And here he starts off ominously for readers anyway. Tell me about your father, Sam. So Cannonball says, how do I answer that? The truth, I reckon. He was an honest, he was as honest as the day is long, sir. Raised all eight of us the best he could given the fact he spent from dusk till dawn in the mines, trying to keep us all fed and clothed. He did it because a count of he loved us, and in the end, that love is probably what killed him. Um, so, yeah, Cannonball's father dead, and from all the hard work and all the cold um, dust down in the mines and so on and so forth. And you can see here, and this is really well done as well, Graydon Creed holding his drink there, his ice drink, and his hand is shaking. But you can see the grip on the hand of the hand on the glass and the shaking as well. It's good. That's very well done. And um, Cannonball there asking him and you, sir, what about your father? And let's see what's Creedon going to say or reveal here. Well, he reveals it with his body language. He smashes that glass in his fist. Gotcha, says Cannonball to himself. And then uh, aloud says, sir, are you okay? Let me go get some ice or some no he um, exclaims sam i'm fine but his hand is bleeding my father and i were not as close as you and yours apparently we didn't see a lot of each other while i was growing up sam says i'm sorry don't be he was actually something of a disappointment responds creed yet to be fair i can honestly say he was inspirational and this is this is kind of wild we have the uh the wild yeah it is wild is the wild bestial cat-like face of Sabretooth reflected in the new glass there on the table it is a really crazy looking image of Graydon Creed's father um, that's one way of putting it thinks Sam to himself and then we're back in the hospital Mount Sinai Hospital New York City and um, Gambit is there keeping watch on Iceman's father sitting um, um, out on the window ledge and uh, Iceman's father asks him you're one of his friends right Gambit says never thought of it that way mon ami but yeah I'm a friend of your son's and he says I'll go get him why why do you do it asks the father you're a good looking guy like my son if you didn't tell people you were a mutant who would know and um, Gambit just turns away from that. Now Gambit does have those weird red eyes, so there is something a little bit um, odd about him, but Gambit feeling guilty about that sin of his past at the moment. Um, we're all in the lead up to Uncanny X-Men 350 for the reveal about that. Anyway, when um, Iceman's father starts coughing, he comes over to see if he's okay. And I like this, you okay? And the father says, yeah, never better. So. Um, nice dry humor from Iceman's father like father like son maybe in that regard um, what about you Mr. Drake asks Gambit so he's showing some interest here that's intriguing and the father says that's a dumb question nobody asked you to go up against Creed on behalf of us mutants but you did and uh, Iceman's father says that's different 
in his own way he was threatening my family a lot of families it isn't right so gambit says that's why he does it that's the same reason why we do it sir why we fight instead of hide because it ain't right um and a nice uh, concluding shot there mostly everything in silhouette but it reads really well then outside in the parking lot um we have some of these um friends of humanity types and they are there to finish off the father and any mutants that might be guarding him creed was right when he figured beating on this drake would draw mutants out of the woodwork the place is infested so what have we got asks one of them i'm tracking two on the roof so that's iceman and storm a floor below probably at bedside gambit take them out fine i only feel bad that we can't do it up close and personal so they're going to launch some kind of rocket but not a problem bub says someone off panel but we recognize that phraseology turn the page we're going to see wolverine and there we go we got a huge anchor image of wolverine He's still in that bestial form after issue 100 of his own title look at how he's been working out in the gym those huge muscles on his shoulders and biceps and all the rest and those bone claws he really does look um wildly dangerous and he says to them you want to rumble all up and close and personal i'm just the guy to accommodate you and one of them stutters wolverine right doesn't matter he says and then this is great as well so Madureira pulls back the camera so to speak from the vehicle that they're in and um you can just see it shaking uh as wolverine guts them all so that is uh kind of mecha- it's kind of like extremely violent but also uh i don't know like a little bit hilarious as well um some uh, really dark humor there and now we're back with the heart to heart uninterrupted between iceman and storm that's a really nice top-down angle of them sitting on the edge of the rooftop and storm makes the point plain that um his father loves him and so they're holding hand or he reaches out and holds her hand and now part of the heart to heart she says as you know my parents were killed when i was a child over the years i've often wondered what they would have thought about the direction my life has taken would they have been proud or ashamed in the end would it have even mattered would it truly have changed the decisions i've made so iceman asks when you ask yourself these questions what do you come up with but really nice work on this page good body language good acting um, in the figure work also a device of Madureira's from this era where he would draw Storm's hair and other characters hair so you could just see through it so you've got the light lines there continuing the arc of her eyebrow and eyelashes there um, behind her hair so an interesting little device that um, he's taken to using and then this is very designy here and another device of his from this era is the thick black outline around the whole figure that kind of separates it out from the page and also what he's doing there with the um the front tresses of her fringe as well they're so long they're ridiculous um but again like it's comics it is aesthetics and um it's kind of interesting um making his particular mark on the character so she answers iceman's question and says in a way it is easier for me than it is for you i'm allowed to play both parts of my mind my own and theirs in my dreams they assure me they love me unconditionally they assure me that all the pain and sacrifices made for the greater good are worth it iceman replies sounds nice comforting in its own way and she continues and says in its own way yes but in truth there is nothing i would not give to have known them better to argue with them yes to even disappoint them at times i would accept it all if it meant having them alive and here with me and then lobdell leaves that final panel um open free of dialogue it's just a nice quiet moment as aurora puts her head on iceman's shoulder and of course we've got a little shooting star there as well to really make it a hallmark moment um but it's good stuff you know lobdell is good at that and it kind of follows on from something that is a rid you know that goes back to claremont's run these kinds of heart to hearts between the characters are there in the claremont run lobdell puts his own stamp on it um and but it is what long time readers of x-men would expect the x-men are not just teammates 
they are also like um, surrogate family members, especially since many of them are orphans. So then we're back with the action, so to speak. And that is um, Sam, he's still undercover, but of course there is concern about whether uh, Graydon Creed might be onto him in any way. I really like uh, Madarara's work on this bar here. Um, all the little details, um, including um, the seashells up there. And uh, yeah, all of that, it's really well done. So um, Cannonball calls in to Phoenix, it's Jean Grey. And she's reading a very 90s uh, sword and sorcery fantasy, The Sword of Shannara by Terry Brooks. I read that back in the day. Don't remember too much about it now. Um, and she says to him, behind you at a booth, Bobby's cover has been blown. I, and he replies telepathically um, on her link. I know, Jean. Creed made it a point to tell me what happens to people who are disloyal. If you thought I was bad, you'd have tried to kill me tonight. And Jean says, say the word, Sam, and we'll pull you out now. And he's determined. So I do like this. I do find this in keeping with uh, the characterization of Sam in Fabian Nicieza's run on X-Force. This is much better from Lobdell. Sam says, I appreciate that, man, but I'm fine. I'm in this till the end. That's good stuff. So then we're back at the Mount Sinai Hospital. Um, nice top-down angle again. Madarera very good at that. But we also see, um, again, just a little, what would I say, like little ticks of his style, where just look at those huge shoes. They almost look like clown shoes. They're so big that Gambit is wearing there, standing in the shadows in the corner. And Iceman says to Storm, once he's down again at his father's bedside, I'm not coming back. She says, I understand. You should stay with your father tonight to make certain there are no complications one of us will be back in the morning no he says i mean i'm not coming back to the x-men not for a while anyway so she asks him if he's sure about it and he says it's funny all those times i spent racing from one battle to another one crisis after another the one challenge i never took the time to face was finding something in common with this man right now he and my mother need me as much as the X-Men ever have. So, Iceman gonna take a leave of absence. And again, that's a big trope of the X-Men 2 going all the way back to Claremont's run, the leave of absence. But just look at the way that Madarera is kind of drawing Gambit there in the background. He kind of looks menacing <laughs> standing in the shadows, but it's good. Um, and uh, yeah, and there he is again, kind of standing guard at the door as um, Storm exits. And nice little speed lines there as she walks out of the room. Then may the bright lady be with you, Robert. And remember, you will always have a place among the X-Men. So now we get our quiet conclusion as Iceman sits at his father at the side of his father's bed. And finally does what he did earlier with Storm. It's almost as if it was like trialing to work the to work up to this, to hold his father's hand, his father there, uh, realizing that his son is there, and he says. I'm here for you, Dad, and get ready for the tears, and Dad, I love you. So he finally gets to say that. So that's really nice. Like, Lobdell did a very good job with Iceman um, over the course of his run, did some interesting things with his characterization, um, none more so than exploring that antagonism that Iceman's father had for his son, and then kind of bringing about this um, heart-melting, um, uh, what would we say, reconciliation between father and son here on account of what's happened to the father standing up for his son and all mutants as well. So very good stuff. The saga of Graydon Creed continues in X Factor 130. And we've got two pages of letters here, letters about issue 337. And we have a statement of ownership. And so here we can see that uh, the total sum Number of copies, uh, this is print run, is 550,000. And the actual, that's the average in the previous year, actual number of copies, uh, single issue, of single issue nearest to filing date, 542,000. So we're in the era after the peak of comic sales in 1993. Um, the bubble has burst and sales are tanking. 
but they're still reasonably healthy on um, the X titles, most particularly Uncanny X-Men and Adjectiveless X-Men. But very soon, this issue came out in November of 1996, even though the cover date is January 1997, in just after Christmas, because look here, the next month, X, um, Xmas Eve, Christmas Eve, Cannibal versus Gladiator, just after Christmas, I think it was like the 27th of December, 1996, Marvel filed for chapter 11 bankruptcy. So things were bad um, at the end of 1996 in terms of um, Marvel's financial health and situation. Advertisement here for a new title, Deadpool, um, with uh, Joe Kelly writing and Ed McGuinness spelt wrong um, as artist. And you can see McGuinness's style, how very influenced it is by Madureira. And also that thick black outline that Madureira has brought into his style too. Um, oh yeah, an advertisement here for a crossover between Top Cow and the Marvel Universe. Mark Silvestri always did maintain a very good relationship with Marvel, even after moving over to Image, different from, uh, let's say, Rob Liefeld and McFarlane. So, um, yeah, Mark Silvestri maintained a good relationship with both Tom DeFalco and um, Bob Harris. So we're getting that crossover going on there. And there you go. I do hope that you enjoyed this review and commentary on Uncanny X-Men number 340. Let me know your thoughts on this one in the comment section. If you enjoyed my review and commentary, please like the video in YouTube and share it too. It really does help the channel. If you haven't done so already, subscribe to the channel and stay tuned for more content like this.